Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And today we're gonna to be building a dominator. Today we're building a dominator with all worker parts. Worker Neo motors, worker silver metal cages, and we'll set some wiring. The previous dominator hit 300 FPS with full dart FEJs. Wasn't the most exciting thing in the world. The accuracy was pretty damn terrible. The reliability was absolutely horrible. Here is the pile of motors that I've gone through since owning a Dominator. And I've got to say, it's, it's, it's kind of tragic. It's kind of tragic. Today, we're going to assemble the Worker Dominator. Now, a couple of tricks. These are motor supports. I don't know if we can see them in the camera. Definitely hold the bottom of all motors. When you're pushing wheels on, the worst thing that can happen is those wheels will push the bottom of the, bit of the motor out. And they definitely will push the bottom of the motor out of the bottom of the motor. Slide on really easily and you just place them over the top. A couple of wheels later and you have your functioning cage. Now it's simple enough to push on a wheel, it's harder than it looks to get them off. There's a couple of tools available to get them off and I've got to say more than helpful. Easy as that. As you can see, the Dominator is literally just a three-stage swordfish, the same polycarbonate design. I guess, injection molded. Worker were nice enough to provide a clicky clicky switch. I mean, rated for whatever stupid worker motor they think you need. Titans, burn those motors out. So basically, these are a Titan Kronos 2 motor. They spin at 54,000 RPM. And they were my go-to motor for, for all cases, every case. The reliability on them ranges from about 10 seconds to 10 hours, depending on how, depending on the motor itself. There is literally nothing that sets them apart from any other motor. They may have up there, make their own mind up. They decide to melt for no reason whatsoever. And we are desperate for some sort of high RPM, high torque, high current replacement for these motors. Achieving 300 FPS on a flywheeler isn't the easiest thing in the world. And it's definitely dependent on the motor, cage, and dart setup that you're using. The Kronos 2s got us to that limit, but they weren't the motor that we needed. Today we're going to be looking at the, today we're going to be looking at the worker Neo motor. We spin a 43,000 RPM, a 132 size, and I believe 45 amps per motor, which allows us to nicely use one MOSFET wiring loom per bank of motors. And a bank of motors being the three on each side. Save time, we've already gone and done the really boring stuff already, but I will show you a couple of things. Each MOSFET is more than capable of carrying a load way higher than any motor is gonna stall at individually. When you're banking these together, you need to realize that one or two motors might turn on before others. To reduce this, I wire all of my motors along one side per MOSFET rather than one cage per MOSFET. When you're installing the worker dominator cages, there's a spacing that's left and worker doesn't provide a filler of any kind. You're gonna to need to measure down a piece of the barrel material. We originally started cutting down the silver, the, the silver, the orange metal inner barrel to fit the gaps between the two cages. After a fair bit of testing, we found out that the worker metal inner barrels, when a dart wasn't aligned as well, 
caused a dart to roll over far more than the work a 30 centimeter straight groove barrel. Which is interesting because now there's more space between the dart, but but anyway. The each space needs to be cut down to create a spacer so that each cage nicely joins together and there is no gap between them. When you're doing these builds, the trick is to choose appropriate motors, appropriate wheels and appropriate cages. The metal wheels provide increased momentum. It takes longer to slow them down. It takes more effort to slow them down once they're at a certain speed. The spacing in the cages means that having a differential crush is an impedance. Having a smaller first stage crush actually reduces the amount of FPS you get if you were to have all of the same crush or having increasing or variable or dynamic crush. All this goes out the window if you allow a cage to have an extra space between it. If two cages don't have any one dart between them, then you allow for individual power between each cage and it's not going to affect the dart coming out of one cage. After a whole bunch of dominators, I found out that putting a cage, two cages closer together, that's as a two stage together, <clears throat> is more accurate, more reliable, and overall a better idea than having spaced cages. When you are putting two stages together, they have to be of the same crush. We don't use it in the Dominator, um, and it's never been something that I've used in the Dominator. After you get to 300 FPS, you don't really need to shoot a dart any faster. And out of a flywheel, the length of the barrel you need to keep that thing from fishtailing is, is kind of amazing. So the Dominator starts in its simplest as a shell with a switch and a mag release. Probably the simplest blaster worker of released. And it comes with all the pieces that everyone needs to do all the fun stuff. The auto kit costs $35 on top of the cage itself, on the shell itself, and it's well worth the investment. Comes with these fancy voltage control knobs, which can be used to control, which according to worker should have been used to control the first stage. But I'll tell you, anything you anything good, any good motor will blow this within a second. It's not even worth installing on the first cage. What it is good is saving for a second project and using the spare one in something else, which I've been known to do. Today we're going to be installing the auto kit and to save time, I've already wired the auto kit. I mean, it's kind of silly to sit here and watch me wire an auto kit for three hours. There's plenty of demonstrations online of how to do a three switch rapid strike and that's essentially all we've done here. When you're assembling a flywheel or it pays, it always pays to install the pieces before screwing them in. Lay everything in, mark it out, cut to the right length. Don't go hiding cables and bending cables and twisting them into a ball just to fit the location. Sure, I pre-done this one earlier, so it's all right. The wiring harnesses that I use, I prefer to use the big old-fashioned TT2, T-O, T-T, T-O, 220 MOSFET, the through-hole ones. Mm -hmm. When available, I attach a heat sink. Normally I don't. Normally I use this one beast has six MOSFETs in it. Heat sinks don't really apply when you're using so many MOSFETs because you're never really hitting the maximum rating anyway. I create what I call Y harnesses and I simply splice in another set of cable to create another leg so that I can attach a motor to it. And all the neutrals from all the motors are going into this one MOSFET that then attaches to the battery when required.
To build a wiring harness for the main section of the blaster is a little bit more complicated. I choose to splice in wires where available. You're assembling any blaster, and that goes for springers, flywheelers, anything. You want to lay out all the parts as best as possible to have them all arranged in a, a way that will facilitate the easiest possible building of the blaster. Starting from one end and working your way back to the other, from essentially on a flywheeler, the motors, back to the power control system. It always turns out that the more complicated stuff ends up at the rear. And I mean, you can put these things anywhere, diodes, MOSFETs, resistors, they can all end up anywhere you like. For convenience sake, they usually end up at the back. When you're doing any electrical work, you have to. I mean, I can't stress this enough. You have to insulate the conductors from any metal that they could be touching. A conductor touching the side of the motor, it, it won't look like much and you won't see any, any obvious signs that it's doing anything wrong, but it's creating excess heat. It's building up energy and it's, it's going to end up bad for you anyway. Leaving these things exposed is never a good idea. When you're using the shrink, I always use the shrink I call it shrinky dink. And we just need enough to cover the bare metal. I find the easiest way to do the motor terminals is to cut a strip. Obviously I've cut this one a bit larger, but to cut a strip that has a hole or a diagonal cut in one side so that it can slide over each motor. And luckily for us, we get to do six of them right now. How, how exciting, or 12. And it takes no time at all to cut these little pieces out. And these are the things that are required in any good blaster. If you want your blaster, if you want longevity from your blaster, shortcuts are never gonna help you. And I'm gonna take 10. And now we come to the fun part, soldering. I'm not sure if anyone else has been through soldering tonight, but soldering isn't something that people need to be afraid of. Sure, it's a hot, melty iron, and it's going to poke you, and it's going to burn you, and you're going to have some sort of residual scarring when it does hit you, I promise. But it's not something you need to shy away from. The proper technique is called tinning, and every component that you attach a piece of solder to requires you to coat that piece of solder in the tin. So you'll take your soldering iron, you'll lightly heat up the area you want to attach it to, and you'll put a little bit of solder on, and that solder will flow like a liquid, just through the heat. People use, you're, you're, more than a few people use flux to get that. And flux is literally just a heat transfer liquid, and it allows this, the solder or the heat from the soldering iron to transfer through the cable or the wire that you're soldering together faster and easier to let the, the solder then flow where the flux was. Now, when it comes to solder, not all solder is created equal. I use 60-40 solder wire, and that's 40% lead, 60% tin, I believe, with a 2% flux core. So that it means for every, inside the solder, there's 2% flux. The more expensive the solder you buy, the more flux, the more rosin, the more fancy things they put in the solder, but it's essentially all the same. When you're joining your conductors to the motor, the trick is to solder them at equal temperatures. 
the wire takes a lot longer to heat up than the actual terminal on the motor. The motor terminal is a flimsy little piece of metal and it's already coated in solder. So about a couple of, half a second is enough to get that hot enough to join the two pieces. It'll take a good three or four seconds to get the piece of conductor hot enough to allow the solder to flow between them. The trick is to tin the two pieces together. So you tin one end. and tin another. And now you have two tinned pieces of conductor that you can join to your tinned piece of motor terminal. Simply by heating the two up to an equal temperature, the solder will flow between them. And that'll join, that'll be all you need to join those two pieces together. And by simply sliding over the cover and applying a little bit of heat, a little bit of heat, you can shrink the shrinky dink into place, protecting it from any kind of electrical short that my heat might heat up or burn out the motor. Motor burnouts are an interesting thing. 90% of the time they're caused by stress, stress onto the shaft of each motor. Motor spins at 54,000 RPM and when a dart hits it, it's gonna, there's gonna be some sort of mechanical interaction that's gonna cause it to bend, flex or what. To prevent this, I use the metal cages in my Dominator. And although they don't provide the best FPS available, and I have other blasters that, are achieve, that achieve 300 FPS, the metal cages provide a reliability that allows me to last an entire game using Kronos 2 motors. So with any luck tonight, if we push on and uh, stop blabbering, we can assemble this Dominator the way Worker intended, as far as I can tell. And I made this loom ahead of time, just kind of hoping, so bear with me. But every blast is gonna be different. Buying a loom or a pre-made wiring harness, while easier, negates all the fun in my mind of having a blaster or a, a powerful blaster, anyway. I don't think they sell them anymore. I know Blaster Tech used to. Shouts out to the sponsors though, especially Blaster Tech. Uh, I presume majority of this is provided by Blaster Tech or supplied by Blaster Tech. Provided. I went and bought this. And thank you. Yeah, that just happened. Live. And it's 1.21 in the morning, and I'm hoping to uh, have at least these three cages installed. The previous Dominator that we're basing this all off, the uh, Duress, as we've named it, dubbed it, it's probably one of my favorite blasters. It's been through everything. Every iteration, every design. And we finally settled, or we, by we, I mean me, have finally settled on something that I believe tonight will be the last time I build it. Well, last time I rethink it's built, at least. Now, when you're soldering the solder onto these motor terminals, they are tiny little terminals and they heat up quickly and they are susceptible to having the solder drip onto a separate part of the, the motor. There can be no solder touching the edges of the motor. The metal casing of the motor cannot have solder on it whatsoever. If you do end up getting solder on it, um, spend the time to remove it if you don't have an appropriate solder removing tool. But in the end, turning it upside down and heating it will uh, 
always get rid of what you what ails you. Now with all brush motors, there is two directions, the motor spin left or the motor spin right. There is no positive or negative. There is no red wire or blue wire. It doesn't matter which side you use, as long as you use the same side on both sides. Well, sorry, the opposing side on both sides and know appropriately which wire you're gonna connect. Which I have not done tonight, but it is late and it's a quick fix. So for those that don't know me, my name is Tom and oh shit, I guess my entire life revolves around owning a Dominator apparently. This segment is brought to you by uh, Spontaneous Combustion and the fire extinguisher is around the corner. So there we were. Two of the three cages wired up to power and we're gonna look to a start installing the third cage and the MOSFET. Now MOSFETs come in all shapes and sizes, every kind of variety you can imagine. Um, Airzone was on here previously discussing MOSFETs. And the MOSFET vault board, since I've been in Nerf, has evolved from what started as just me, or just us, sticking MOSFETs into a few cables and calling it a MOSFET harness. Two entire MOSFET boards populated with every kind of functionality you could require. This being the, uh, you gonna get a picture of that? The smallest iteration yet. I believe 330 amps without any active cooling. I don't know how you'd fit some sort of cooling system on that thing, but data sheets are data sheets. Now, when reading a data sheet, the most important thing to realize is that a lot of these numbers are at a certain temperature. The second you turn on a MOSFET, it's gonna get hot. And depending on the load, it's gonna get really hot. To negate this, you're gonna use a heat sink. And most blasters, most MOSFETs will require a heat sink, depending on the application, obviously. But once you're trying to achieve these velocities, you're gonna need heat sinks. You can piggyback MOSFETs on the same circuit on a heat sink. So one heat sink can do two MOSFETs. Don't quote me on it, I do it all the time. Now there's no right or wrong way to create a wiring harness. It comes down to practicality and really a personal choice. There's a couple of things you wouldn't do. I mean, you can't use undersized cable and you have to have everything rated for the right size. But, that, but in the end, this is the cable that's gonna go into the end of my battery. It doesn't matter where I connect the power or how I connect the power or if I have all these intricate leads or intricate connections, it's all gonna end up coming down one end. It's 
Swing the solder in the last two cages, the last power for the last cage. And again, we're going to tin the conductor. We're going to heat up the tip of the of the silver. We're going to heat up the cable. Just cable. We're going to apply a tiny bit of solder to the soldering iron before heating it up. That allows the heat to transfer a lot better. A dry soldering iron won't transfer heat as well as a wet soldering iron. And I say wet because, it, you know, once this stuff's melted, it looks wet. Now, I don't know if you'll notice, but I blow away the smoke that comes from my soldering iron and you can get a picture of this. Yeah, now we can see it. Is that smoke coming off my soldering iron? It's literally burning lead. So I'd avoid that. I'd avoid that. Again, joining two conductors, you want to heat them to equal temperatures. Allow the solder to join, allow the solder to flow between them and then cool them down rapidly. I just blow on them. When it comes to soldering irons, not all soldering irons are created equally. A cheap soldering iron is a cheap soldering iron and will only cause you trouble. I go with these big soldering stations that I've taped off because of the bright light is bright light. And they have paid off immensely. I, I think it's about $34 just for the soldering iron attachment, um, but it has made my life invaluably easier. When installing the wiring loom, it's important to bend it into a right position so it's not going to hang up on anything. Bending these cables isn't an issue. I use silicon coated cables. Blaster Tech sell them, any hobby store will sell them. Uh, you can get them basically anywhere. Very easy to cut, mold, maneuver, bend, shape, all sorts of fancy things. In case anyone is playing along at home, the MOSFETs I'm using for this build are the IRF 1405 MOSFETs. Each one's rated at 169 amps at 25 degrees. 25 to 25 degrees. Bearing in mind that these things, the only time these things are at 25 degrees is when they're sitting on a shelf somewhere. The moment you turn them on, they're well past 25 degrees. I pointed it out before, but I'd be wiring these motors in series down each side of the blaster. This one for diagram. Where are I seeing these? The wiring will go along each side rather than along each cage. Now, the reasoning for this is absolutely stupid. It turns out that by the time each motor gets the signal to start and the neutral return ends up at the battery, the shorter the distance between the battery and the uh, motor, the quicker it's going to turn on. And we're talking milliseconds here, lightning speed milliseconds. Why not? Allowing inrush current is also another thing. All these DC motors produce inrush current, which is usually rule of thumb is three times, three times stall current. I mean, with this lightning fast speed, it means nothing to so many people, and you do you really don't see it. But when you're stressing a MOSFET to its absolute nth degree, you're going to notice these things. Which is why I use two to three MOSFETs per build, or in certain cases, six MOSFETs. And yes, it is overkill. Obviously, I have lots of time on my hands, so it's fine. But you know, labor of love, labor of love.
each dominator has uh, been exciting, whether it's lasted 10 seconds on the field, and they have. I've pulled these things out and shot four darts and put them in the bag for the rest of the day. I owned a hurricane once that caught fire after about six starts. I still haven't owned another hurricane. A rip hurricane. There is a, uh, I was going to say untold, but shit, everybody knows it now. If I build something, it's likely to catch fire. It's not likely to catch fire. It probably will. So we blame cheap MOSFETs. And for a time, eBay was a good source of MOSFETs, which turned out to be really stupid. Uh, cheap MOSFET is not the way to go. They charge between 3 to $7 for one of the MOSFETs that I'm using tonight. I think I got mine for $5.95 each. I buy them on my local JCAR. ZT2468 is the catalog number in case anyone's interested. And they're cheap. They're not cheap. They're expensive. And they're widely available and they suit our application perfectly. So when soldering, solder gets old and it gets too hot and it burns. And once it's completely I don't know, melted, it just doesn't work the way it used to. Clean, fresh solder is the only way to go. If you're reusing parts, clear off all the old solder. There is a technique and there is a trick to it. And there are countless videos on YouTube to show you how to remove the solder from parts that you're not using anymore or you want to reuse. But it's tough to solder old solder onto new solder. Or just with old solder in general. So I use the heat shrink to shrink my conductors to seal my conductors against any kind of insulate, any kind of problem that they might encounter. Usually it's something being pushed or prodded or pulled that bends the metal contactor down onto the motor casing itself, which causes a little short. And you don't see it and you don't hear it, but it builds up heat. And it ends up ruining those motors as evident by pile O motors. Crack on with MOSFETs, huh? Jeez, thirsty work talking about all this stuff. So MOSFETs get wired in in no particular order. It's not like there's some magic order that you need to put them in. If you are doing a multi MOSFET build, they need to be a, they need to be assembled in parallel. A uh, series MOSFET, I don't even, yeah, series is never going to work. Parallel MOSFET harnesses are an easy thing to build and a very common thing to build, and I end up using them more often than not on uh, stripes, moduluses, and everything in between. I know uh, more than a few moduluses around that have dual MOSFET built. But if anyone's interested, I also do a uh, 
260 or 260 FPS modulus and everything in between. I recommend you check out our Inst my Instagram page. I'll post a link up for, for it later. You'll have to come back, unfortunately. There's no link posting right now. And so the nice little harness that kind of resembles an upside down dog just needs to get crammed wherever you can fit it. Now I assemble all my blasters upside down. Um, I don't know whether that's just me, but it gives me a much greater flexibility of where I'm going to put my parts and how I'm going to assemble my things. If you live in Australia, J-Car sell the little shrinky tube. You can also get it from any hardware store in packs. Um, I recommend picking up a pack anytime you see it. They're usually only a couple of dollars and they are invaluable. Now again, a good soldering iron makes short work of every situation. Soldering irons come in a few shapes and sizes these days. The original two being a soldering gun, sorry, I'm over here. the original two being a soldering gun, which is literally a click button tool that has two wires that come out of it, two coils that come out of it, and is a bulky beast of a of burden. Yeah, it's not something a hobby grade person is going to ever look at. It's mainly used for uh, inducing heat into massive cables. But if you're using one, kudos. The other type of soldering iron are the standard pen iron. They come in a few different shapes and forms. You can get butane ones. You can get that are, that are extremely portable, extremely heat quick to use. They heat up great. Um, the only problem is you need to carry around a can of or you need to make sure they're always full with the butane. They last a while. I've got one that, that I think I've only ever refilled twice. And I take it out with me to uh, matches and games in case Worst case, and I mean, it's happened a couple of times. Someone switch breaks, you can replace a switch on the field with a butane soldering iron. The other ones being the cheap plug into the wall soldering iron, which is honestly not worth your time and effort. They, they come in a varying range of wattage and none of them are gonna do the job that you really want them to do when you need them to do it. I mean, they're all sufficient for doing what we're doing right now but something will happen. You'll need to do something a little bit more fiddly or with a little bit more finesse and you just won't get there. So I highly recommend the uh, station soldering line for that reason. Also, don't forget that shrinky dink. So I use a couple of really handy tools. Firstly, the side cutters, and they are on a 45 degree angle and you can buy them on any sort of angle. Cool. On any sort of angle, apparently I've got a close up of my face now. And they work really well. They allow you to do most things Devices over here. That's cool. They allow you to do basically everything cut a little piece of wire, trim it to the size you need. Huh. Which is really, really handy. I use another sort of pointy snips. And the trick is just to gently pierce around each piece of cable and pull it out as required. 
leaving you with a nice flat face. Which is always fun. I'm gonna go ahead and solder on the last two motor terminals and get one entire bank of MOSFETs fired up. Do that really quickly. And we can have a dominator in no time. Now, for those that don't know me, I play exclusively in Sydney. Sydney Nerf are nice enough to have me come down and shoot them with close to uh, 300 FPS of Dominator goodness every month or so. That being said, they offer Dart Hire. And all of this started because Dart Hire at Sydney Nerf fires FVJs essentially exclusively, which means all my blasters needed to fire FVJs. That's where the story of the Dominator was born. Using any higher crush than 43, 42 and a half mil, you're unable to get the kind of, I didn't. And that's the best, the best thing about the Dominator is once you do get them all worked out and sorted, they fire an amazing dart faster than most people can imagine. Well, yes. So over in Sydney, we shoot each other with FVJs exclusively at 300 and at 350 FPS as our maximum cap. Getting an FVJ to fly at 300 FPS, a full length FVJ to fly at 300 FPS is some sort of uh, miracle. After probably 240, 260 FPS, each dart just spirals, cartwheels or fishtails out of control. Getting a dart to actually successfully travel 260 FPS in a straight line consistently requires yeah, 45 centimeter barrels, which I, I, I do run regularly and I do enjoy running and it's pretty entertaining. So lately we've been using the Dominator, I say we, but lately I've been using the Dominator in a short dart capacity. And thanks to a really ingenious creator, I'm sure we've all seen these before, the Thalon DMAG, we're now shooting a short dart to 230, 225 FPS, and it, the accuracy is unheard of. You point, you click, you shoot, you hit, and you, you make sure you tell that person that was you from all the way back there with a the flywheel. The range is unheard of. These things have to be seen in person to uh, really gain any perspective of how powerful they are. Even the dual stage moduluses that get up around that kind of limit the 260 limit, uh, just don't compare to shooting a short dart at the same speeds. <clears throat> After this, I will uh, definitely be posting a couple of footage, a couple of bits of footage from our, one of our, or a couple of our games in the past, unfortunately, of this bad boy in action. 
Well, not this one in particular. And we're hoping, we're hoping these new worker Neo motors are the game changer. The Kronos 2 motors were amazing for RPM and torque, but they just didn't hold their own in the reliability department, basically being the worst, least reliable motor I think I've ever used in my life. Fistful of motors. So eventually these become a bit of an issue in themselves. There isn't a lot of room. Once you start using big 16 gauge wires between motors and MOSFETs. And then having a fit of diode in. Now the flyback diode, every piece of electrical equipment that spins or basically every piece of electrical equipment creates some sort of electrical interference or electrical frequency or electrical current. In the case of motors, they create their own current when they, when they aren't powered. So basically when they, when they aren't powered, they become a little mini generator. That current going backwards will damage MOSFETs, control systems, circuit boards, Arduinos, Naftuinos, all of the cool fun stuff. So we use flyback diodes to prevent this. And it is simply a diode I've left over there. From JCAR, they cost about a cent or 10 cents each if you're unlucky. Um, and you buy them in packs of a thousand. And you can run anything without them. You don't need them off. You do need them. You don't have to have them but you should be having them in your system and it prevents MOSFET damage and it saves you a lot of headaches with noise in systems that require some sort of microcontroller or microprocessor. God, what would they know about that? So you'll find the older MOSFET boards will have also a capacitor the debouncing, and that isn't required in 90% of the builds. I can't recommend these little pliers enough. Um, I'll show you these ones. Got a little point to them. They come in all shapes and sizes. We've got these ones that are pointy, these ones that are flat. When getting into hard to reach places, your fingers just don't cut it sometimes. Well, my big fat fingers just don't cut it sometimes. Other people have better luck with that stuff. I don't think I've talked too much in my, my whole life. So essentially we're building a blaster upside down. The easiest way, it, it's, it's far easier to build these things in one consecutive train or line or, or position than it is to try and manipulate cables and bend them in the wrong direction. When you're building these, blasters, especially the higher power blasters, it pays to have the cables in the right place at the right time. I mean, there's nothing worse than going through all this work trying to close it and it not work, it not close. I'll tell you how many times that's happened. Hot. 
I got my first Dominator probably the week it came out. I uh, ordered mine off AK Blaster Mods, and they were extremely efficient. And I have to shout out to AK Blaster Mods for getting me uh, the old puppy Duress. And we've been through a lot together with this one. For all those out there disappointed with the Dominator, and I know there's a lot of uh, a lot of bad talk. Well, not bad talk, but a lot of a lot of Dominators don't live up to their full potential, and a lot of people see that and expect them to be all Dominators. Not all Dominators are the same. Not all motors are the same. Not all wheel combos are the same. I'm not going to mention any specific names or combinations besides the ones that we're doing here tonight because everybody makes great products. There's a uh, fantastic motor guide that tells you the RPM, the torque of all motors and puts them on a really nice graph and allows you to make a, a really, really educated decision about what you're going to use on your blaster. I highly recommend it before you go out and just purchase the same motors that everyone else has been buying. Shout out to them all being good, but something uh, different would uh, not kill people. So I've been championing the Kronos teams, and I say championing because literally these suckers have gone into every single blaster I've used personally, and that's a huge. That's saying something huge. I uh, I go to wars with 12 blasters and I probably come home with four functioning ones and I put them solely down to uh, Kronos 2 failures and basically pushing them to way past what they were ever designed for, whatever they were designed for. After all that, I've come to the uh, conclusion that more crush is not everything. Um, the daybreak crowd. We don't need a 38 mil crush to get these glass ceiling velocities. Somewhere, someone's done all the maths for this. Uh, the outer wheel diameter the outer wheel speed for each of these wheels is somewhere in 320, 330 ish FPS. So each wheel at the outermost point spins at about 330 FPS, which means there is no pushing 72,000 RPMs or 54,000 RPM setups, 54,000 RPM setups any further than 290, 280 FPS. And that's at a conceivable efficiency of 80%, which is. It's pretty crazy. It's pretty crazy to say that each set is doing a, an efficiency of it's eight over three mass. So we're just going to lay everything out, put everything in, roll everything over. And adjust for the uh, left handedness, which is one of my uh, These spaces, these couplers, you can live without them. I mean, there's a whole bunch of cages out there for a whole bunch of builds that have a gap between them. 
and either no concave or no support for the dart while it's traveling between cages. I can't express. How much I don't like that in a build. So when the dart, when the dart is moving through cages or moving through the, the the blaster itself, it needs to be supported at least at the top, coming out of the magazine, because magazines don't sit level, or at the bottom and along the sides while it's traveling through the cages. Magazines don't sit level. Whole another issue. To get achievable FPS, to get a good FPS result time and time again, rather than one or two darts and uh, a mixed average, a really wide var varying average, it's due to cage alignment. And literally the wheels or the dart aren't making contact the way they should, and they are once or twice. And then from that point on afterwards, they aren't ever again. And that is majority of where people will go let themselves down. Sure, it would have been an amazing blaster if it had got that a consistent average rather than 300 FPS and then 100 FPS every other time. To slice cable, to splice cable, it's a pretty simple thing. You just need to slice off enough of the conductor on each side so that you can uh, create a joint. Yeah, he said that. And so we're gonna wind off enough of this conductor to make it back to the switch so we can put the wiring in for our MOSFETs. I'm gonna roughly lay that out and cut it. Always leaving yourself more than enough length because you never wanna shortchange yourself. So to strip a cable, there's a bunch of different ways. It's really easy, it's really simple. You can go out and you can buy those cable strippers and there's all these different kinds and shapes and forms. You just get something sharp, cut it on a few sides, really softly, really gently. The plastic takes nothing to cut compared to the copper. A quick pull and you're left with nothing but insulator. I mean, no more insulator. So again, soldering something onto something else is actually really easy and people mistakenly believe it is a trial or some sort of episode that they can't do. All we're doing is tinning two pieces. We apply solder to the two pieces that we want so that they now essentially are tinned. My solder is 60% uh, tin. That smoke that's going off in the air, that's the lead. So we're gonna tin the two parts. The MOSFET is surprisingly easy to tin. It's literally designed to transfer heat as easily as possible. The conductor on the other hand is a little bit more, is a, is a lot thicker. The uh, circle shape of it makes it a lot more uh, molecularly dense. There's a lot more material in there than there is on the arm of the MOSFET, even though they are capable of taking way more current. Interesting fact. I'm going to cut my two little pieces that I dropped all the way over there somehow. Attach them to the leg of each MOSFET. Each MOSFET, where is a MOSFET for me? One second. Each MOSFET comes with three legs. There are only a MOSFET symbol. There are only three parts. Oh, it was on the keyboard the whole time. There are only three parts. So there's the gate, the drain, and the source. Obviously the gate is the first one in order, gate, drain, source. 
gate being the thing that opens and closes, pretty obvious, drain being the thing that is sucking the power, and source being where you're getting the power from. Now, interestingly enough, interestingly enough, just because it has a positive symbol on it, isn't always the source. But that's a whole other MOSFET story for another time. So essentially, we're just cutting two little pieces of copper wire. We're going to solder those onto the gate of each MOSFET so that we can activate them at exactly the same time. And again, science says that the shorter the distance between the MOS, between the shorter the distance differential, the quicker each MOSFET will turn on. I, uh, in practicality, you don't see that in real life. So both MOSFETs will activate at essentially the exact same time and you won't even notice. Now each MOSFET is installed with a resistor, which I am just fiddling with now to make sure that it's connected when I solder on the little piece of copper wire. The resistor is only job is to make sure that there is no power left in the circuit when you turn that circuit off. One of the uh, interesting facts about flywheel and brushed motors in general is they create their own power when they're not in use but still spinning. The resistor in series allows us a point of lower resistance to send the energy to neutral where it's not used or required. Now we're gonna do what's called a lineman splice for all those paying attention at home. And basically Western Union were the people that uh, came around and said, this is how you join cables together. Western Union. And so in order to get our MOSFET wiring harness completely wired up in the next 25 minutes and put a dart through a crony, we're going to use a couple of bits of wire between the clicky clicky switch that worker were nice enough to provide for us in every single dominator shell and our MOSFET bank that we just put in. Now alignment splice, you get your two conductors, join them in the middle or touch them in the middle, create an X and then fold each side of the X over one way or the other and the other until it is a nice little spiral. And we call it a Western Union lineman splice. Who knows, right? But they were the guys that said it had to be done like that. And then you can join a conductor in any kind of way. You can twist the two together, tie it with a ribbon and put it on the shelf for all I can. But if you're not gonna solder them, there's really no point in building these things whatsoever. Twisting two wires together is not gonna get you anywhere, I promise. If you don't know how to use a soldering iron, there are a hundred million YouTube tutorials available. Really easy, takes a couple of minutes. You'll burn yourself a few times. It'll be good times. And of course, make sure we coat every coat, cover every single join in some sort of trinket ink or insulator. I mean, electrical tape does work and electrical tape will work. It, it just is not pretty and it leaves this unsightly residue that's really annoying over everything that it touches. Um, I don't recommend, you'll, you'll find out, you'll find out. 
So now we've wired up the three cages, the six motors, the MOSFET harnesses, all together in one go. And essentially we just hold this in my hand and someone else will pull the trigger and go for our lives, right? But it looks a lot prettier. When you coax this thing into a dominator shell. Pretty. Worker were kind enough to provide us with a big bag of goodies with every single Dominator. Um, they're good guys. I mean, the obligatory flashlight holders, no one can find the flashlight. If you can find the flashlight that fits, that's supposed to hold inside this flashlight holder at the front of all Dominators, please hit me up. I would love to buy one from you or 3D print one. I haven't really looked, it just comes up from time to time. Inside each Dominator package, they give you two of these shims and these shims basically shorten down the mag well so you don't have to use these massive 40 mag, 40 round mags. And the idea was really good. Uh, we we'll double stack our mags just like the military do. Have one dart either side, all that kind of crap. Yeah, thanks, worker. Reliability issues skyrocketed the fact that you weren't shooting a dart directly into a cage anymore. You were now shooting a dart off to the side of each cage. I know that might sound weird, but if the dart isn't entering the cage in a straight line, chances are it's not coming out of the cage in a straight line either. And alignment issues being the uh, the crux of all the bad flywheeler builds. And I mean, we've all been there before. Expected results versus achieved results. And you spend all night building a blaster and it only hits 100, 100 FPS. Whereas the guy next door did it in about an hour and uh, got 200 standard, right? That's a Springer thing technically. We're all going to get 130 out of every flywheel. So when it comes to building one of these dominators, they do not come cheap. Um, for what you get in every single little package, in every single little box that's required to assemble one of these, isn't a lot, isn't a lot. I think a, uh, a set of motors from Blaster Tech, all how Blaster Tech, a set of motors from Blaster Tech is about uh, $35 or $33 for the same set of working Neo motors. Kronos 2s are no cheaper. Um, I think they're $12 each or $16 each. I can't, I can't 100% remember. But all in all, you're looking at about $350 to us to build and assemble each each worker dominator as worker entitled or envisioned. Obviously we're not going to get to workers full in the <laughs> sort of workers full vision tonight, but uh, it will definitely be on display over the next coming days, I'm gonna say. I'd say hours, but it's uh 212 in the morning and uh, we're just about to fire up a a dominator for the first time. It's the fun thing about flywheelers, they uh, come together a lot quicker. Well, the progress seems slow at the start. It seems like you're grinding on. But honestly, we've only got four or five things left to do here.
Now, when you are heating up the cable to solder, the trick is to heat it up from the bottom so that the solder and all the heat can rise up and through rather than around. Looks like we're down to red. And again, cover your mistakes with the shrinky dink. Now we're gonna cut in a diode and cutting in the diode for some people seems to be this really, really demanding procedure. For me, the hardest part is that I left it over there. So we're gonna take the side cutters and we're lightly, ever so lightly, just gonna snip a little groove into the cable so that we can, I don't know if you can see that, expose a little bit of the conductor. We're gonna use some sharp and poking to poke a hole through it. One diode, diodes, power only flows one way through a diode. You need a diode at least, I think it's three amps or one amp, not the tiny little one, you need a, the next size up. The tiny little one has been known to blow in auspicious occasions, usually Halloween or whenever Tom takes to the field with a uh, Nerf blaster, great for him. And we're literally just gonna insert that between the negative and the positive down at the end of the loom. I like to have everything at the end of the loom because there is a lot more space in the dominator down here towards the back. Now with the diode, the power normally flows up and gets stopped. This time we are going to use it the other way around so that it uh, comes back and gets stopped, which requires the line to be at the red side instead of at the brown side. The little monomic device to remember that is the power fills up the cup. It will fill up that little line, up to that little line. In this case, we're using it in reverse. Again, the trick is equal or greater temperature. The bigger conductor requires more heat. The solder will flow onto the lower, onto the smaller conductor. Now, while we're here messing around with the diode, we can run our MOSFET enable or 12 volt circuit. Now with the dominator, it's not necessary to remove the switch. The cable will simply insert underneath the mounting tabs. And a little creative guidance, put straight through. Now there's only two parts of this switch we're gonna use. We're gonna use the common and the normally open. And the three sections of these switches are common, which all power goes to, normally open, which is constantly open when it's not doing anything which means it's not on when you're not doing when you're not using it and they're normally closed which means it's always on even if the switch it's not on it's on when the switch isn't pressed so we want to wire it to it turns on when the switch is pressed the other option being it turns off when the switch is pressed and means it is always on when the switch is off which is not what we want at all. And all switches are marked with that, those three symbols, common, normally open, and normally closed. 
this one being a uh, worker. When you're playing with electricity, there is only one tool that you need, and it is a multimeter. You can buy them from any store, they're cheap, they're accessible. You don't need one as big and clumsy as this. Those tiny little ones you see in the hardware store will work for our application. Just don't go sticking them into your power points. So we're going to use the multimeter to find out which one of these switches is normally open, normally closed by testing continuity between the comms and the normally closed. Whereas we test between the other one and we don't get anything because obviously that turns on when I push the trigger. Sorry, I stuck on the cable. We're going to be wiring our white cable to the first and the second terminal. And we're just going to gorilla style, heat up one terminal, apply some solder, heat up the conductor and apply a little bit more solder to it. Removing these things is optional. Obviously slightly easier, slightly more time consuming. If you do overheat any part, the trick is to wait. You don't want to spend forever heating up one part, hoping that uh, a little bit more heat will cure one hour's use. Because I promise you, it will not. Using colored wires is uh, especially a good thing. In this one instance, we're not going to get to that point. That's definitely the thought that counts. So we've wired the MOSFETs to the switch, the MOSFETs together. The MOSFETs to the switch, and all that is left is the switch to power. Now, the power can be taken from anywhere. I much prefer to take it from after the diode or at the diode, as case in fact. Wire cutters. Wire strippers were so last year. All right, and due to time constraints, we are going, probably not going to assemble the other side of the shell. Yep. Now with any electrical endeavor, I highly recommend a pair of helping hands. You can buy them from any hardware store, any electrical store.
and they will save you all the time and effort in the world. They're just literally two alligator clips that hold on like a crab and grab onto your project so you don't have to. I mean, having a third hand helps. I think four hands is uh, invaluable. You can see here that I uh, do not own such a device. And we'll be picking one up momentarily. Hmm. And if you have any questions, comments, tips, I believe there was a uh, Facebook post, post to that, comment, message me, add me, friend me, call me, don't call me, please don't call me. <laughs> this is the battery that I've uh, successfully been using for the Dominator. That's a 60C, 4,200 milliamp, 3S LiPo in a hard shell, hard case. Hard shell, hard case, because I do like to drop things. So there we are wiring up three stage dominator. Definitely makes a prettier noise than the old one, which I power up for comparison. The old dominator being somewhat of the loudest thing since a hairdryer had sex with a jet engine. And so Dominator 2.0. I'm going to say a good 30% quieter than the original Dominator. We are going to uh, steal a barrel, find a dart. Let's steal a copper barrel, find a dart, and do a quick brony test. With any luck, look at that. Here's one I bought earlier. With a crony that has gone walkabouts. Oh, I will do a separate crony video. We are running out of time unless this crony just miraculously is. Good times. Either way, a few firing demos just for the kids at home. The sound of these things is uh, something to be remembered. I'm trying to aim it towards the, uh, the window, hopefully, not break it again. Plug the battery in first. Minor heart attack, like when you lose your wallet, leave your keys somewhere, turn the blaster on on live stream, and it doesn't start. Oh, yeah. <laughs> sound that makes. I mean, it's, it's quite a damn impression. <laughs> And we'll do a crony video in, uh, say, 10 minutes. Thanks everyone for watching. If you uh, have any questions, feel free to get in contact. We'll be doing it all over again, and I'm sure the next person will be even better. Probably better looking, too, and have a cleaner desk. I'm not gonna lie. But hey, no fire. Thank you. How do we do this?